Today, we would like to extend a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Vanessa Hintz. Prior to the youth conference, our planning committee had a chance to meet Dr. Vanessa virtually to share our thoughts and opinions on what is going on locally within our communities. Dr. Vanessa is a licensed clinical psychologist who received her doctorate in clinical psychology from the Chicago School of Professional Psychology. Dr. Vanessa is from Wisconsin. However, our team originally met her at a local conference this past year, and we're, we were impressed by her ability to talk about substance use in light of social justice, pop culture, and a number of different other topics. Dr. Vanessa works directly with children, adolescents, and adults with a wide array of pre presenting issues. She has extensive training in working with individuals who have been exposed to traumatic experiences, those with co-occurring substance use issues, as well as those struggling with emotional regulation. One fun fact that we love about Dr. Vanessa is that she is a self-proclaimed geek therapist, and she incorporates elements of pop culture into her work. Please welcome Dr. Vanessa. Thank you all so much. Good morning. I'm very happy to be here on this very, very early morning for me. I typically don't do anything before 10 a.m. So, but I'm happy to be here. Um, and I'm just gonna get right into it. As I'm pulling up my presentation, can somebody on the staff just let me know time-wise? Because I, I talk too much. So let me know <laughs> what, what time should I be done? Uh, you should be done at uh, like 10, 10, 40, 10, 45, 10, 50. Okay, got it, got it. Okay, awesome. So can everyone see this next to me? Okay, hey, all right. I like to be fancy. So okay. um, what I'm excited to talk to you all about this morning is uh, emotions, which is everyone's favorite thing, uh, emotions and feelings and coping and all of these grand things and how we can be mindful of how we feel um, in the midst of, of life, in the midst of, you know, activism um, and also ways we can cope. I heard, um, I think it was Sarah on the panel earlier talk about, you know, making sure that your cup is filled. And we're going to talk a little bit about ways that you can do that and also ways that you can recognize because I'm speaking from experience as an overachiever and someone who always says yes to everything. Sometimes I don't know when my cup needs to be refilled. refilled. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about some ways to be mindful of that. So first and foremost, before I start any discussion with anyone anywhere, um, I like to make acknowledgements just about atrocities um, from the past so that we can shed light on them. And so I'm in the Milwaukee, Wisconsin area, which is um, occupied territory of the Ho-Chunk, Menominee, and Potawatomi peoples. And so I like to use that language, like I'm living on stolen land, as we all are, um, and acknowledge that um, that was a thing that happened. And so um, it's important for me to sort of ask for forgiveness for that, number one, but also for um, strength um, from the, the ancestors of the, the first peoples um, that stewarded this land. I also want to acknowledge um, that it is impossible for me to separate anything I do as a psychologist, as a Black woman, as a human being in America from the atrocities of enslavement. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that we are very much still fighting that fight today um, against racism. And so again, I ask for um, strength from my ancestors who sort of built this nation. Um, I ask for their strength as I continue on this sort of journey towards liberation and equity. So. I also want to lift up these names um, at the outset because I think that a lot of the, unfortunately, um, a lot of the opportunities that I've received over the past year to give talks and presentations about justice, social justice have been because of, of the murders of these people that you see here. Um, and I started this collage last summer um, and it's grown exponentially, exponent, exponentially over that time and that's just very unfortunate. Um, so again, I wanna lift up the names of these folks, um, in particular, Brianna Taylor, um, because she was murdered in a town that I, I would call one of my hometowns in Louisville, Kentucky. And so it just hit me a lot different um, given that she's a black woman. She was a black woman and that it took place in, in, a, in a place that I, I went to college in Louisville. So very unfortunate. And again, just wanna lift up these names um, in honor and ask again for strength as we continue on. So this is uh, what we're gonna do today. 
now that we got all of that out of the way, um, we're going to talk a little bit about this sort of intersection between how we identify culturally, what, what our values are, and senses of, a sense of belonging. So like, who are your people? Like, where do you find, who, who's your group? Like, who are your, pe your people? And I feel like where those things intersect is in activism. And so we're gonna talk very briefly about that. And then we're gonna move uh, a lot of the meat and potatoes, if you will, what we're gonna talk about um, are emotions and emotional intelligence and also strategies for coping. Because I don't think, we can ever have too many coping strategies um, because as, as we all probably saw over the past year, at the beginning of quarantine, the things that we were doing to cope were like so cool. Everybody was baking bread or going and doing this and doing that. And then, you know, a year plus in, nobody wants to do any of that anymore. So to be able to have different options of things that you can utilize um, when you just need to, you know, reset, um, we're gonna talk about those not only on an individual level, but also collectively. So what can we do to cope like in, in terms of the greater good, right? Like how can we just make a better society, if you will? Um, and then lastly, my, my hope is that we have enough time to have open dialogue and discussion and, and for you all to ask questions or share whatever you feel comfortable. So I'm gonna just tell you more about myself because I feel like it's a, it's a therapist thing. It's also just, a, I like to contextualize myself because a lot of um, what I talk about is so deeply personal. So as I mentioned, I'm, I'm a psychologist, which means I just went to school for all the years, um, and I have all the student loan debt, so it's a lot, um, but I love what I do. So as a psychologist, I, I'm a therapist, so I primarily work with Black people um, who are seeking a Black therapist. I also do, I'm a college professor, so I teach um, at a local college here in Milwaukee, and then I do this type of work. Um, so I do trainings, professional development with folks who really just want to get their social justice on, really, just to get their stuff together. Um, in addition, I identify as a Black woman, and I have a white mom. I just like to say that to people, like, I am biracial and absolutely identify as a Black woman. I don't know, I don't think you can see my cursor, but this picture um, of me in the middle from my graduation, those are my parents. And so growing up, I grew up in Las Vegas. Um, it was just very... I grew up with my mom primarily. And so when she would have to come to school to talk to somebody about something I did, they'd always be like, that's not your, that's not your mom. Like that's a white lady. It totally is my mom. So I'm a black woman with a white mom. I'm also a wife with a white husband, like super white, you know? And I think that again, being in an interracial relationship is always a thing, but it's particularly a thing over the past year and in Wisconsin, because this is just a mess. Um, I'm also a nerd, um, as Amanda mentioned, that is part of, you can see my Funkos over here, like that's part of what I do. Um, that's, it's, I, I weave that into every single thing that I do. You see this shirt I'm wearing, this is how I dress all the time. And so if anybody wants to talk about any of that later, I'll be available. Um, I'm a millennial, I think we get blamed for a lot of stuff that's not our fault. Um, so I like to just say that at the outset, um, we're pretty dope, not all that bad stuff that you hear. And then lastly, um, I'm, I'm someone who <laughs> attempts to seek balance in a lot of the things I do. Right now, the balance that I'm trying to find is, is between food and fitness because I love food so much, but I don't like the way it's making my face so round. And so I'm trying to love fitness. I love fitness too. I just love food more. And so I'm really trying to figure out where that balance is. So if anybody knows, you can just direct message me and let me know. So that's me. Um, and now I want to hear from you all. So this is my way to virtually read the room. Um, so we're going to do a live interactive poll and I'm going to pull it up here. And usually I have to explain this in very explicit steps because I'm working with old people, but you all are young folks. So I know that you can, you'll get it like right away. So if everybody could go to this website, let me make sure I pull up the right screen. It is slido.com. Hold on one second. Up. Can you all see this? This blue screen? Okay. So if you go to slido.com, it's going to ask you to put in an event code. And our event code is 388464. There's going to be two questions. So the first one we're going to do is just a, a one word response. Um, and that is what one word would you use to describe your typical mood? So how would you say you feel most of the time? 
And there we go, yes. And as answers come in, this is going to be a word cloud. So um, words that appear bigger are those that we see more often. Anxious, boom, see, anxious is huge. That's what I would have wrote to, <laughs> anxious. And so I'll give you all a minute or so to respond and then we'll move on to question two. Whoever put bubbly, I idolize you in this moment because that's like the opposite of what I, <laughs> the shade. I also love that a lot of these are feelings words. Usually when you ask people how they feel, they say, fine, that's not a feeling word, but these are, these are amazing. Okay, we'll give it about another minute or so, and then we'll move on to question two. I also live for whoever wrote optimistic, also the opposite of what I am. And as these are, whoever wrote like a golden retriever, I love you. Um, as these are coming through, I invite you all just to take notes, um, silently reflect on what you see, um, and just keep that in mind as we move forward um, in our discussion today. So keep those coming. I'm going to move on to question two, which hopefully will transition seamlessly, um, which this is more open-ended. So these, these responses are going to show up in like a list. Um, so question two I have for you all is, <laughs> what do you hope to gain from our discussion today? I just got done talking about how I need to stop eating so much and somebody wrote cookie. I love you though. I love you for that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, this is beautiful. Hmm. People talking about these cookies. Um, I wish I could. I wish I could provide that for you. And again, I invite you all to take in what you see um, with regard to, again, what your peers and what other participants here are thinking in terms of. Um, goals they have even for today. I think it's just interesting. Give it about another minute or so, and then we'll continue on. Ooh, yes, how do I identify anxiety? Mm. <clears throat> All right, so like I said, keep them coming. Um, I'm going to stop my screen share now and continue on um, with the rest of the presentation. So, okay, there we go. Okay, so first and foremost, we're gonna talk a little bit about identity. Now I'm sure that you all have been talked to death about identity, um, given, where, given where you are in your life. So I'm not going to I'm not going to beat you over the head with it. I'm just going to talk about it in very specific terms. And again, those terms are going to be related to your culture, your values and your sense of belonging. Um, and so because arguably uh, the first two things, nobody is without culture and values. Belonging, though, is something that I feel like people value in different ways. Some people want it. Some people don't. Some people want it but can't get, you know, so we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well. So when I talk to people about culture and, and sort of like, how would you answer the question, tell me about yourself? Like, I'm sure if anyone has ever been to a job interview, that's the first thing people typically ask. And it's the question that I hate because as a therapist, I'm like, what, what does that even mean? But I'm gonna tell you a little bit about maybe what it can mean for you. And so this is something that I actually um, came across in graduate school. So when I'm thinking about how I identify culturally and you saw, when I did my whole little intro, like if someone said, tell me about yourself, that is all stuff that I would tell them. 
Um, this is another sort of guide that you all can use when you're thinking about yourself as a cultural being. And so I like this, it's an acronym. There's like way too many letters, but it's an acronym. Um, a lot of them being self-explanatory. So we're just gonna go through these. And again, I invite you all to think about how you identify along these different, um, in these different areas. So first age, easy, very easy. We're talking about chronological age. So how, how old are you based on when you were born? The next two, um, developmental disabilities, I don't like that word, but that's the language that this author used. Um, anything that we talk about that's developmental, that's something that you've had to deal with since birth. Like since the womb, like if you were born and you can only see out of one eye, if you were born with some sort of physical ailment, if you were born with you know being deaf in one ear, that's what we would call a developmental disability. Again, not my language. The second, disability line that we see are those things that we acquire later in life. So I would argue if you have any sort of mental health concerns that you work actively to manage, that is something that I would put on that sort of third line there where we're talking about disabilities acquired later in life. So I, in, turn, in the spirit of radical transparency, deal with a lot of anxiety. Um, and that is absolutely something that I feel I have to work actively to manage. That's not something I just tell people because that's a gift for me to give that to you, my vulnerability. But if I were feeling this out for myself, that's something that I would put there. And then religion, spirituality, again, self-explanatory. Um, and race and ethnicity, I feel like you identify how you identify. So as I mentioned, I identify as a Black woman. Beyond the fact that my dad was born in Kentucky and my mom was born in Indiana, I don't know nothing else about my heritage. I mean, obviously we... At some point, my ancestors came from Africa. Outside of that, do I know where? Do I know where my mom's people came from? Absolutely not. And so if somebody asked me, you know, how do I identify culture? I, like you heard me say, I'm a biracial Black woman. But for some of you, you might have a very strong, like, German heritage, Italian. Um, you may Brazilian. Like, however you choose to identify, I think you're the one who gets to decide what are the most important aspects of your identity. Socioeconomic status is one that I feel like is difficult because what does that even mean? Like, what is the middle class? What is the, I don't even know. All I know is that I'm not in the top 1%. Outside of that, again, if that's something that you truly align with, like I, I know a lot of people who, you know, grew up in poverty and that's something that became a part of, of who they are and sort of part of their story. So I, again, I invite you all to think about, is that a thing for you? If you come from a place of privilege and you know, you live in a two income household Maybe that's something that's part of how you identify. Um, sexual orientation, again, how you identify is how you identify. I'm not here to tell anyone to label themselves. If there is a label that you feel very um, is very important to you, that's something that you can share when you think about, again, how you identify as a cultural being. Um, are you indigenous to this land? So again, I mentioned at the outset, um, the First Nations that, that so we're sort of like occupying all of their territory. Are you a member of, of, of one of the First Nations? Again, that could be something that is important to you and how you identify. And again, national origin is kind of, it is to me, if you were born somewhere other than the United States, and maybe that's something that's important to you, like you immigrated here when you were two or when you were whatever, you know? Um, and then lastly, gender. And again, however you identify, I think that both gender and sexual orientation exist on a spectrum. And wherever you find yourself on that spectrum, is A-OK -okay with me and should be A-OK -okay with everyone else. So again, I invite you all to just reflect on that as we're moving through the conversation and talking more specifically about, you know, knowing yourself. Think about these things as we continue on. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is values. And let me just warn everybody, just brace yourself, it's about to get real nerdy up in here. So if you don't like that, I'm sorry. I'm not sorry, but I'm going to say I'm sorry. So when you think about values and those things that these are things that you feel like are very important to you. So, for example, for myself, um, equity and justice are two things that are very important to me um, and very important to me in that I just that is infused that guides every single thing that I do. Um, and these are also rules that we live by. So if I'm faced with some sort of decision that I need to make. Values are the things that help me to make that decision. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit next about if you go against or with your values, how that might make you feel. And values are also those things that help us figure out like our moral compass, right? So what is good, what is bad, what is right, what is wrong? 
And as you all have seen throughout your life, we all don't always agree on what those things are. And so I think for each of us individually, it's important for us to go through and really think about what, what is it that I think is right and wrong, up, down, left, right. And I think those things are, are our values. And again, sort of like our North Star as we move through life. And so when we go against values, uh, go against the things that we authentically, I, that was another thing that came up during the panel discussion, a theme that I, I too, that's something that I value is authenticity. So when we're going against our values, that can lead us to feel angry, to feel sadness, shame is a big one, and then guilt. So if I asked all of you to think about a time somebody asked you to do something and you did it, even though you really didn't want to and you felt like it was wrong, that's, that's an example of going against your values. Maybe somebody asked you to engage in a behavior, to do whatever, something that you felt like in your heart of hearts was not something you wanted to do, but you did it anyway because of whatever. Um, oftentimes, again, that leads to these feelings that I just mentioned, shame, guilt, all of those types of things. On the other hand, when we sort of live more authentically, or I like the phrase walk in our truth, um, we tend to experience more feelings of calm happiness, dignity, and pride. And so again, I think I just invite you all to think about what are moments in your life where you felt really proud of what you did? Like very much proud and you just told everyone. You told everyone, or maybe you told no one, but still you felt very proud. I would argue that was a time in your life that you were acting in accordance with your values. I told you it was about to get super nerdy up in here. So this is this is a, a collage of just many a different superheroes. Heroes. I know it's probably very small and you may not be able to see all of them. Um, but one thing I, I like about this collage um, is that of all these different heroes on here, some of which are maybe villains, whatever, of all these different characters that we see on here, they each live by their own set of values, their own code, if you will. Um, and so there is not one correct way to be. There's not one correct way to think about life, to think about right, wrong. Again, there's, not, there's not one way. Um, and I think that it's okay that that's the case. And so as you all are thinking about what is it that I value? What is it that I find important? If what you say is different than what your best friend says, is different than what your sister says, that's okay. There's no one, there's no right way. There's no like something written in the star somewhere that says, this is how we all should be. Okay, and so the last thing we're gonna talk about before we move into talking more specifically about emotions is a sense of belonging. So when we talk about belonging, we're talking about social connection. And this happens when we have close relationships with other people in our lives. So that could be our family, chosen or otherwise, that could be friends that we have, different groups that we're involved in, communities, communities, et cetera. And when we feel a strong sense of social support, we have better mental and physical health, um, we feel safer, we feel less stressed, and we feel better about ourselves. Um, because I would argue we are born to be in relation with other people. Like human beings are not wired to be isolated. And so when we are isolated, we experience a lot of negative effects because of that. And so on the other hand, when we feel connected to other people in a really authentic and true way that aligns with our values, we just, they're, they're just positive outcomes all around. So again, just to point your attention to this photo, um, rest in heaven to Chadwick Boseman. So hopefully everyone listening to me right now has seen Black Panther. And if you haven't, I'm just very sorry. If you have, great, you know who these two characters are. So this is T'Challa, AKA Black Panther and his sister Shuri. Um, and so when we think about like in there, in the movie, um, in all the movies that we've seen them in, their connection is just so strong. Their bond is so strong. And I think oftentimes it's easier, easier, not easy, but easier for us to connect with people who look like us. So oftentimes in spaces, when I, when I enter a space, if it's a professional space, sometimes I'm like the only black person there. And if I see another black person, like that's the person I'm, I'm gonna go talk to. Like that's, that's where I'm going. Or if I come into a space and someone also has on a nerdy shirt, boom, I'm gonna go talk to them. Because again, there's something about that similarity that, that just drives me to wanna be connected to that person. Similarly, if, if I see someone from the same neighborhood, I saw somebody um, write in the chat that they, they're from Vegas, like boom, automatically I feel connected to you just because. 
Um, we usually connect more with people who are around our same age. I will admit being in this virtual room right now, I feel like an old person and that's okay. That's okay. Um, but I'm sure that it's easier for you all to connect with one another than to connect with someone who's older, younger, what have you. And then if someone shares our same religious or spiritual values, because typically those values like are, are the same values we use that guide our everyday life and guide our sort of behavior. And so if someone is also acting in accordance with those values, we feel connected to them. That's why when people go to church, like every time I go to church, I'm like always crying. And it's because I just feel like a, a sense of connection with people that are there. On the other hand, um, it's more difficult for us to connect with people who maybe don't look like us. So like I said, if I walk into a room, which again happens, happens often, and I'm like the only black person in a room full of white people, it makes me feel uncomfortable. Um, and not because like, oh my gosh, all white people are terrible. No, it's more so because of, you know, just history and, and, and not feeling like other people understand what I'm going through. And so similarly, when people are from different neighborhoods, I work in therapy with people who have like a lot of money. That's never been my life. I've never been in a position where I don't have to worry about money. Um, and so I, it's hard for me to connect with those people who don't have those problems. You know what I'm saying? And again, as I mentioned, it may be more difficult to connect with people who are older or younger than you or who have different religious or spiritual values. We saw this play out very much so, very beautifully so, with the very beautiful Michael B. Jordan in the Black Panther film. It's also in the comics, but definitely in the Black Panther film between T'Challa and Eric Killmonger. They were just not getting along because they definitely had different sets of values. Although they looked the same, they were of the same national origin, like they were both Wakandan, they didn't get along because their values just did not align. And so again, not that that's a bad thing. I mean, it was kind of a bad thing in the movie because he wanted to do bad things, but that doesn't always have to be a bad thing. And so again, this is a scene, spoiler alert, if you haven't seen it, but this is a scene from Avengers Endgame when everybody was just coming out those little circles um, to fight Thanos. And so when we share values with people, um, we're able to more readily form relationships with them feel connected with them and feel like we found our group, we found our tribe. This scene to this day, every time I watch it, I have to like look away because it like makes me tear up. Um, because again, just seeing all of those different characters fighting for one, so there was one aim and it was like that, it was to beat Thanos. And so again, I just thought it was just very beautifully done. And so again, you saw sort of all these people um, that were connected along, along a shared set of values, which is like valuing human life over Thanos and his shenanigans. On the other hand, uh, again, spoiler alert, Captain America Civil War, if you all have not seen that film, I highly recommend. But in that film, again, we saw these sort of two groups of heroes that were disconnected because they didn't share the same values. I don't even remember what they were arguing about. I think it was like the Zakovia Accords or something. Um, but they were arguing because of, you know, Captain America felt one way, Iron Man felt another way about what they should be doing. And so when we are in groups with people that don't think the way we do, don't behave the way we do, we don't feel connected with them. And it can be very isolating and we can feel like we don't belong. Again, as a black person that often exists in primarily white spaces, this is real. It is very real. And even though I worked so hard to get everything that I did, I can instantly come into a room and feel like I don't belong there because I don't see anybody that looks like me. And sometimes people don't have the same values that I do. We all have the same job, but we, we do it in very different ways. So again, these things are very real and can be traced back to those things that we talked about with regard to culture, values, and a sense of belonging. So I invite you all to take just a, a minute or two to reflect on what we talked about. So these varying levels of identity. So identity overarchingly, like holistically, that is answering the question of who are you? When we think about our values, I invite you all to think about what are those, and I use this term loosely, rules that you want to live by. What do you feel like is your North Star? What guides you um, in your actions? Sense of belonging. Um, again, who are your people? 
Like who, who are your people? Who is your tribe? To me, I found my tribe with the nerds. I really did. Like I've basically been a nerd my whole life. But when I got to be a professional and people were like, yeah, we do this like and psychology at the same time. I was like, say less, we are in it. And th that's my tribe. Those are my people. Um, and then social connection. What are the kinds of relationships that you want to form with other people? So I invite you all to think about that as we move into talking more specifically about activism. And I'm gonna show just a very short video here that talks very specifically about youth-led activism um, because that that's where it's at. To be quite honest, I think that you're, I'm gonna sound like an old person, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but I feel like your generation is, is making stuff happen um, because of all the knowledge that you have about just in, information dissemination and all of that. And so I'm gonna show just a very, very, very short clip to give my voice just like a small break and then we'll continue on. So give me one second to pull this up. If I can find out where it is. Hold on. That's not what I want. You have a lot of people loving your Marvel references and hey. Deadpool t-shirt. <laughs> Thank you so much. Everybody can see this YouTube video now? Okay, awesome. So here we go. Young people have helped drive social movements around the world. From protesting the established order to furthering new ideas, Youth are often on the front lines of political and social transformations, hoping to make the world a better place. Reasons for youth participation in movements vary. Compared to adults, youth often have larger social networks, which can serve as conduits for the transmission of ideas and mobilization. Young people are also more inclined to be innovative in their use of media. They may adopt the latest technologies to help spread their message and mission. Also, youth may have more time and bandwidth than older generations, giving them a greater chance to take risks and fight the status quo. Altogether, reasons such as these make youth participation in social movements an incredibly powerful element. Okay, cool. Um, so, oh my God. okay. So what I appreciate too about that clip is they were, the, the narrator was talking about risk-taking. And I know that that's what a lot of our panelists mentioned earlier um, is advice that they would give to their younger selves. And so I just very much appreciate that. Um, and so moving forward again, I think activism, as I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, is where all of these things intersect. Like how do I identify culturally what are my values and who are my people? Because I think when those three things come together, we have act we have activists, we have activism. And as I mentioned, as the video mentioned, and, and as I'll sort of reiterate, I think that youth-led activism is the key to change. I'm someone who's naturally cynical and it's like nothing is ever gonna change, but you know, I don't really believe that in my heart of hearts. Um, Excuse me, and I think that you all have so much power again because of your way of sharing information and utilizing digital platforms to do so. Like I'm reminded of what happened when um, all those folks bought those that ticket, those tickets for that Trump rally, and nobody was there. Like that was dope. I'm sorry if that offends anyone. I apologize. I will say that I thought that was dope. You know, and those are that's just a very small example um, of again the power that you all have. So I invite you to, as you reflect on all the stuff we talked about, lean in to that power and, and use it because it, it's powerful, for lack of a better phrase. So the next thing I'm gonna talk about, and I'm gonna go through it really quickly so we can get to talking more specifically about coping is emotional intelligence. So I don't know if you all have ever heard this phrase, but emotional intelligence is not only being aware of what you feel emotionally, but also others. So when you are in these communities with other people who are like-minded, who share values, and maybe even people that don't, how well, for lack of a better word, are you able to recognize their emotions in the moment? And so there's basically five different competencies, which that's just like a fancy word. I don't know why that's the word, but there's five different aspects, if you will, of emotional intelligence. 
And we're gonna go through each very quickly because they're all exactly what they sound like. A lot of social psychology is exactly what it sounds like. So self-awareness is exactly what it sounds like. The ability to recognize and understand your own emotions and how those emotions may impact other people. So for example, when I give talks and, I, and I'm talking about issues of race and racism, I understand that that makes people uncomfortable. And I understand that that can make people feel all kinds of things. And so I am very mindful, not of how I say things because like, I'm gonna say what I'm gonna say, but I am very mindful of however people react. Like I can't be upset if someone's like, Dr. Vanessa, that's stupid. All right, cool, bro. Like, that's cool. You know what I'm saying? And so if you want to think about and sort of assess your own level of self-awareness, I invite you to reflect on this question. What emotions would you like to be more aware of as they're happening? So what are some emotions that you feel like sneak up on you? And it's like, oh, dang, like now I'm upset. Like people who go from zero to 100 with anger, like zero to the Incredible Hulk, like that, I would argue that that's an opportunity for you to be more aware of maybe triggers to your anger, or maybe if you're just sitting calm and then the next minute you look up, you, you feel very anxious, that would be an opportunity for you to practice more self-awareness. And that is what we do in therapy. I think therapy is great and everyone should go. Um, secondly, we're gonna talk about motivation. So motivation is this, in this sense is what motivates you on the inside. So like I go to work because I get paid. Like that's an outside motivation. I also do the work that I do because I'm passionate about it and because it aligns with my values. That's an internal sense of motivation. So when you're thinking about what motivates you to be your best, that's how you sort of assess your, in, we call it intrinsic or internal motivations. And when we're talking about emotions, again, we're talking about those things that are internal. Next, we're gonna talk about self-regulation, which is again, exactly what it sounds like. So how well, are you able to manage your emotions and the disruption that it may have on your life and or other people? So again, like if I get upset in the middle of a meeting and I just flip the table, that's gonna have a negative effect on me and on other people. And so when you're thinking about your own level of self-regulation, I invite you all to reflect on what emotions do you feel like most disrupt your life? And I would say hunger for me, that's not even an emotion. But when I'm hungry, like, just stop it. Don't even talk to me. Or when I'm tired, don't talk to me. But I think outside of that, when I get, um, when I feel disrespected, I don't even know what kind of emotion that is. But when I feel disrespected, I just forget entirely where I am, who I'm talking to and all these. And it's very disruptive. So that's something that I'm working actively on because where I live, people talk reckless. And that happens very often. Social skills, again, exactly what it sounds like. How do you feel like you're able to utilize your, um, manage and utilize your emotions in social spaces? So what emotions do you feel like help you in social spaces? So if you're one of those people that can go into any room and talk to anyone and it's like, oh, this is so great, that, that would be an emotion or a skill that helps you in social situations. Whereas for me, I think it was Justin that mentioned earlier that he, he'll go to any event, like he'll just go. I'm like the opposite. Somebody will be like, Vanessa, let's go somewhere. I'm like, all right, bet. And I know I'm not going. I know I'm not going to go, but I just, I don't know. Like, I don't know if that's like my own anxiety or whatever. I'm all, just always tired. Um, but that hinders me in social situations because people want to connect with me. And I'm like, no, I'm just going to go home and watch my soaps. You know, like, so again, for you, I invite you to think about that. And if there are things that you feel like help you in social situations and things that maybe hinder you. And then lastly, empathy, which we're going to talk much, much more specifically about empathy. But I like to iterate because I think empathy is a word that has been co-opted and now has sort of been empathy to me. A lot of people think empathy is having poor boundaries, like being just involved in everybody's business. And no, 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 that is not empathy. I think empathy is being able to really feel it's a feeling. It's not it's not a thought. It's a feeling being able to feel somebody else's emotions and again not because we have poor boundaries and we're in everybody's business but really connecting to someone on an emotional level and we're going to talk more specifically about that um, a little bit later but that is all emotional intelligence um, and so now we're going to talk more specifically and this is the last piece we have before we get to questions and discussion coping so given everything we talked about understanding who you are understanding how you feel, we're gonna talk a little bit now about how do you deal with life? Because it'd be a lot. 
it just be a whole lot, especially this past year. Life has just been too much. And I think part of the reason it's been so much this past year is because there are so many things that are uncertain. Um, and so with, with COVID, especially even again, if you identify as a person of color or if you identify as, you know, LGBTQ plus, there are definitely, when you, when you walk into spaces, it's uncertain. Like, how are people going to respond to me? Um, and so I think that the uncertainty is something that we're always, 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 always coping with. I would argue that anxiety is, 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 is uncertainty that's just like sort of bubbling up and manifesting. And so if you think about for yourself, is this me? Do you feel like when something is about to happen, you worry about every possible scenario? So like, what if this, what if this, what if this, what if this? Do you feel like you're constantly seeking approval from other people? Are you a micromanager? Are you a procrastinator? Do you repeatedly check things? Like you write a paper and you read it like 10,000 times before you turn it in. Arguably, these are signs that you're having difficulties dealing with uncertainty. Um, I often tell my clients, it is what it is. To me, that's like the ultimate rebuttal to like, oh, it's uncertain. Okay, well, it is what it is. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit more about adopting that sort of mindfulness. Um, but when we talk about uncertainty tolerance, again, this is that's the ability to accept things that are uncertain. And spoiler alert, life is uncertain. So I feel like we never escape this. Um, but ways that we can cope with this, ways that we can cope with not knowing is to work on acceptance. Um, I've recently started meditating more consistently. And so um, one thing I appreciate about meditation is this idea that we observe things without judgment. And so me being able to recognize that things are happening, but not necessarily judge it as good, bad, or otherwise, to me is that's acceptance. Also practicing opposite action. So opposite action is, for example, like when I said earlier, someone will say, Vanessa, do you want to go somewhere? And automatically I'm like, nope. Opposite action would be to actually go. Opposite action would be to tell them that I'm not going to go and, and not to say I'm going to go and not show up. Um, if you feel like you have negative thoughts about yourself, opposite action would be to look in the mirror and say three things, say three affirmations about yourself. And so sometimes if we do that enough times, we can start to cope with uncertainty a little bit better. <clears throat> and then focusing on what you can control, which we're going to talk about more specifically right now. I just knew that was right there. Um, when we think about what we can and cannot control, for some people, they have what we call an internal locus of control, which is this idea that I make things happen in my life. Like I have the ability to make change. Whereas for other people, they experience what we call an external locus of control, where you feel like things just happen to you. So again, oftentimes people that are people of color or people who identify as LGBTQ plus or just some sort of other marginalized group um, feel like, why would I even do anything? Like the world is not for me. The world is not a nice place to me. So why, why even bother? And so sometimes in therapy and counseling, we're working to get people to more of an internal space because you absolutely make things happen in your life. Absolutely. That doesn't mean it's not difficult. You absolutely always have power in situations though. And that when we talk about focusing on the things that you can control, that's focusing on where your power lies because you always, always, always have power in situations. Another thing that I like to, to talk to people about, and some of you may have heard of this, is this idea of the wise mind. And so we have parts of our mind that are absolutely reasonable, logical, analytical, like people who always wanna talk about numbers, like oh, math, it's so fun. Cool. We also have another side of our brain and our mind that is <clears throat> more emotional. So I'm sure we can all think of a time where we were so upset that no matter what anybody said or did, it didn't make any sense. That would arguably, arguably be you using your emotional mind. Now, the, the idea behind wise mind is that we bring aspects of each of these together. I'm sure everybody knows what a Venn diagram is. And so you see that in the middle, um, where the rational and emotional meet, that's where we want to be when we're making decisions. So often I hear like, don't bring your emotions into it. That's no, yes, bring your emotions into it because that's the way our brains are wired. Our brains are wired to do that. 
And so what we want to do, though, is have a balance. And what that balance looks like for you depends on the situation. So sometimes more emotion is cool. Sometimes more logic is cool. But the idea is that, again, we're utilizing both of those aspects of our mind when we're making decisions, when we're thinking about things. So now I'm gonna talk very specifically about just some individual coping strategies that I like to share with my clients that I work with. And the first is another acronym, uh, T-I-P-P or TIP. So when you start to feel anxious, overwhelmed, turned up, to, to be quite honest, these are some things that you can utilize just to help you in the moment. So the, the first is temperature. So if there's any way that you can change your body temperature, if you're hot, eat some ice, put your face in the freezer. If you're cold, go outside, or if it's, if it's warm outside, or do something that changes the temperature of your body, splash water on your face, go sit in front of a fan, because sometimes that physical shock can help us to snap us out of whatever emotional space that we're in. Another is intense exercise. If you feel turned up, burn off some of that energy do some push-ups, do some burpees, which is like the worst thing ever invented. It's just torturous. Do some burpees, do some jumping jacks, run up and down the steps a whole bunch of times. The first P stands for pace breathing. So um, there's a lot of different breathing techniques you could do on the YouTube, on the YouTube. There's a lot of different, um, very short breathing exercises that you can do. So if you are someplace and you feel overwhelmed, excuse yourself to the bathroom, take out your phone, go to YouTube and look up a breathing ex exercise. And similarly, you can look up what we call paired muscle relaxation. So that's basically from head to toe, like focusing on one muscle group at a time and relaxing yourself. Because typically when we get amped in our mind, our bodies follow suit. Um, grounding, I think somebody also mentioned that on the student panel. Grounding is like the greatest thing I've ever. But basically grounding is when we transfer our attention to whatever is going on within our minds to something that's physically happening. So one thing that I like to do, particularly with younger people is um, five, four, three, two, one. So tell me five things you see, four things you hear, three things you smell. And then you go through, I, I forgot the senses, but you go through all of the senses and you really talk about what's going on in your physical world. Grounding is all about, again, taking our attention away from whatever is going on in our mind and putting it into our physical space so that we can, because ultimately when you start to feel overwhelmed, it's like you're, it's almost like you're lifting up off the ground because everything is so intense. We just want to bring ourselves back down. And lastly, which is my favorite thing, do something that you love. Um, again, I, I like to watch my stories. I like to watch reality TV. I like to watch something that's not serious. Um, and so, or, you know, eat whatever food you like or talk to whoever or do whatever, do something that you like. Um, because again, I think that those things, there are certain chemicals and things that happen in our brain that trigger us when we're doing something that we really enjoy. And so the last piece that we're gonna talk about again are more strategies for the collective good. So how can we work towards creating a greater good in society, right? And so I talked more, or I talked a little bit ago about Empathy, and empathy is very different than sympathy. So empathy, as I mentioned, is an emotion. It's about feeling. It's about connecting with someone because it's like, dang, I don't know exactly what that feels like for you, but I know what anxiety feels like for me. I know what depression feels like for me. I know what rejection feels like for me. That's empathy, whereas sympathy is more so recognizing like, dang, that sucks. That's sympathy. And oftentimes, sympathy is something that makes us feel disconnected, like we talked about before with the sense of belonging. Sympathy, it, that doesn't make me feel like I want to be your friend. Whereas empathy, genuine, authentic care and concern, drives connection. Now, there's a short video. We're not going to watch it for the sake of time, but there's a short video that is done by Brene Brown, who is amazing. But it's, she talks very specifically about the difference between empathy and sympathy. So I can share that link with you all and you can watch it at your leisure, but I wanna make sure we have time for questions at the end. So I'm just gonna continue on and say, um, just to wrap up with regard to talking about activism, um, I'm sure you all have heard this phrase anti-racism very recently because it's been all the rage. Um, and so what I wanna share with you all is 
that anti-racism is about action. And so we were talking about activism. To me, anti-racism is activism um, toward racial justice. And so these are things, again, when we talk about coping skills, strategies for the greater good, these are 10 things that you can do for free towards building a better world and a better society. So these are the 10 keys to everyday race, everyday anti-racism, oh my gosh, everyday anti-racism. And again, all of which are free and, and easy for you to do. And some of which we talked about um, with regard to emotions and emotional intelligence. So love, empathy, being a good ally and doing work like engaging in activism. So I invite you all to think and reflect on those things. And then lastly, for those of you that are out here in these streets doing work, engaging in activism, or for those of you that are at home watching this on the news, watching all of the injustice in the world, these are just a few tips for you all when you find yourself like I did probably every two months or so, but typically last, or the most last summer, what are things that you can do to heal yourself in the face of all this injustice and uncertainty in the world? One, which I know is difficult for some people, is to just take a break from social media, whether that's for a night, whether that's for an hour. Um, you can be informed without being traumatized. Pay attention to what you eat and how you sleep. Because as I mentioned before, being hungry or being tired, you're not even the same person. And so being very mindful of, the, of that and of those things, staying connected to people who love you, whether that's your family that you were born into or the family that you choose, surrounding yourself with people who genuinely care about you, being gentle with yourself. This messed up world that we live in wasn't built overnight, so it's also not going to be changed overnight. So if you're doing what you're doing and you feel like nothing is happening, you're, you're doing enough. You're absolutely doing enough. And then lastly, get involved. However that looks for you. I'm not somebody who is like out marching in the streets, particularly last summer with the COVID. I was like, no, thank you. But I'm involved in other ways. And I, my activism is unique or authentic to me. And so think about for you, what does that look like? And with that, I'm gonna bring it to a close and invite you all to ask any questions share any comments, concerns that you have, because I know I just talked for a very long time. So I open it up to any questions, comments, or concerns that you all have. Uh, so that presentation was chock full of useful information. So first of all, thank you. Um, but do you have any baseline advice for anyone that you always give regardless of geographic or demographic origins? Yes, I do. Um, and that would be um, what I mentioned before about balance, like figuring out for you and for your life, what does that balance look like between caring for yourself and caring for others? Because I think that for some people, some people are just naturally nurturing, you know, people who got like 10 kids, like you can do all of that. Cool. Bless you. Yes. And that's not me. And so finding for yourself, what is your balance between, again, caring for yourself and caring for other people. Because I think that um, when we're out of balance, that's when we experience depression, anxiety, stress. And so figuring out what your balance is and how you are best able to bring yourself back into balance. Does that make sense? Yep. We have a question in the chat too. Okay. Um, what would you say should be the next step if you are self-aware of your emotions and tendencies, but don't know how to rem remedy them. Mm -hmm. So obviously I'm biased, but everybody should go to therapy, not because I think everybody's messed up, but because I think therapy can be proactive. So just like people go to the gym to keep their fitness in order, therapy to me is a space you can go to to keep your mental in order. Um, and so I think that if you don't wanna do that though, if you wanna do sort of do your own reflection, I think there are a lot of like guided journals that you can use because when you're thinking about your emotions, if you have that first part done, right? So you can recognize your emotions, you can recognize your triggers, cool, great, grand, wonderful. The next step is figuring out how you, if, if at all, how you want to change them and how you go about doing so. And I think a lot of that can be done through sort of, that's what we do in therapy is we guide people through that, that journey. If you wanna do it yourself, there are so many guided journals that can help you do so. Some of them are terrible, um, some of them are great. And so I think it's about finding something 
that you can utilize to take you on that journey. Again, therapy is one way. Journaling is another way. Meditation is another way. So those are things that I would recommend with regard to like going on that journey towards managing, and I use that term loosely, your emotions. Good answer. And maybe we can send um, some links to some guided journals, maybe some that you might recommend mm -hmm. um, from Amazon or something um, for the follow-up. Um, how can you improve your empathy slash emotional awareness skills? Practice, question mark? Yes. Um, interestingly enough, I think a lot of um, the way that we interact emotionally has everything to do with us and very little to do with other people. And so I'm obviously biased because I think that everyone should just do this in terms of, you know, being introspective and really thinking about, again, those triggers. So like, I know, like I said, I had to learn that when I become disrespected, whoo, I, another side of me comes out. And so understanding what those triggers are for you. I think when you talk about, you know, improving that awareness uh, within yourself, I also think when we're talking about empathy, um, it's, to me, empathy is not, it's difficult to say. I don't think it's a skill. I think it's really something that is felt and it's hard to figure out how to do that. Um, because again, I think it's just an emotion that is felt. And so if you're in a space where you feel like, oh my gosh, like everyone is crying and I'm not. Like thinking about why that might be, maybe whatever's making them sad is something that you don't care about or whatever. So I think about with empathy, um, maybe um, it's really just coming to know yourself emotionally. Um, and then again, like we talked about before, figuring out like, who are your people? Cause sometimes like, I can't be with people who cry all the time. Like, I don't, I don't have time for that. I don't, my, my boss at work, she always crying. And I'm like, girl, you should go somewhere else with that. You know what I'm saying? But that's just something I learned about myself. So I think developing your capacity for empathy is about knowing yourself. Great answer. I know that we're very short on time, but I have a really important question that I want that I got privately that I want to um, put it out there and then we're going to take a break. But I just want to put this uh, as, as our final question. What advice do you give someone who is black that goes to a predominantly white high school? Mm. Mm. Okay, yes. Um, I would say, and it's interesting because I think um, some of the students mentioned it on the panel earlier, but I would say, um, I wish somebody would have told me this. So I think part of it is understanding, tempering your expectations. So, and again, this might sound very cynical and I'm gonna say it anyway. I think that I walk into most spaces assuming it's gonna be hostile because of the anti-blackness that is so prevalent in America. So I'm like pleasantly surprised when it's not that way. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is nice. Um, and so I think that one is thinking about the expectations that we have of others. Not that you shouldn't have those. I think we should expect everyone to not be trash. I think that, and then also um, going on your own journey of self-exploration around your blackness and how you value that, because I think the world continues to devalue that, will, will continue until something changes. And so I think as black people, we have to get to a place where I can love my blackness and internally for myself. And so I almost build up a barrier around myself so that when I'm experiencing all this hate, it just like rolls off of me. I will say that that is very, 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 very difficult, especially when you have to do that every single day. And believe me, I have to do that every single day. So I feel you, I feel you. And so I think Part of it is, again, your own individual work. Part of it is finding your village of people. Like I have a group of black women that I work with that we just be laughing and talking about everybody who does like absurd things. And that's the way that I cope with it. And so knowing yourself, going on your own sort of racial identity journey, I think is important for any person who identifies as a person of color. And again, finding, how, finding out how you cope with that, whether that be individually yourself or collectively, because again, I think the world is going to continue to be like this for a while. And so figuring out how do I, how do you cope with it? Because again, I think it's just, it, it is what it is. And I, and I don't want to dis, dismiss that because it's terrible. And I know that, you know what I'm saying? Like, this is the world that, that I live in and that I was born into. I hope that's helpful. 
and not morbid. I tend to I, be very cynical. No, I think it's important to recognize the reality. Um, I think it would be great. Maybe you can drop, uh, we put your um, your social media handle somewhere, um, but to maybe include contact information for you um, in the chat as to, I don't know if you do like virtual visits um, and things like that. So that might be a nice way for some students to connect with you after today. Um, but you've been amazing. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Vanessa is not leaving us. She's joining us for the breakout sessions.